All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 38. We're going to begin reading in the very first verse, <laughs> Isaiah 38, in the very first verse. The Bible says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt not die, for thou shalt die and not live. Yeah. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart, and have done that much is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And, he came, and then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go, tell, go say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy day, days fifteen years. And I will deliver thee and the city out of the hand of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees. By this, by, by which the degrees is gone down. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for this good place that you've given us to meet this morning. God, we thank you for each and every one that is here by your own design, by your own pleasure, God, and we pray you that we praise you that we do have an opportunity to look in on thy word once more. Pray, Lord, that you will bless what is preached according to your mercy and grace. Amen. Yeah. Now, it's fairly familiar verses of Scripture, but what we'll be preaching this morning is on times, times up, times done, times over with, time is finished, is what uh, we'll be focusing on, and we'll look at the healing of Hezekiah and, and some of what came out of that. But I want you to see, really, the eighth verse will be our emphasis where, uh, where some minutes, the only time in the, rec the record of all creation where some minutes is repeated in an individual's life. They're lived again. They're reviewed again. They're done again. And, it, and it, it's the only time that we ever have that. And I believe it's for our benefit to look on those minutes because that will never happen for you. You will never get to repeat anything. You'll never get to redo anything. You'll ne never get to relieve, relive anything. What is done is done. Yeah. And uh, we should look at that very closely and in that find that life truly is precious. In the first verse, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now, uh, you think some of my sermons are bad. Uh, what about if you received that one? Uh, the, the full assurance that death was very, very near. Now, I've never preached that, but I can assure each and every one of you, death is very, very near. It's a lot closer than you think. And even if you live, live the normal course of man, it's a lot closer than we think. Time goes by like that. Uh, last Friday night, Donna and I have been out of high school 35 years. And that is just unreal to me. It's gone by like that. But here we are, 35 years later, and all the time that's passed between then and now can in no way ever be repeated ever again. That's how time is counted. Uh, now, we count time, but do we uh, appreciate time? Do we, uh, do we use it to the best benefit 
of ourselves and of the Lord. Now, uh, sometimes yes and sometimes no. So uh, Hezekiah gets this, this, what most would view as tragic news that, that death was coming, that death was very near, that this illness would take him out. Now, when a physician says that, uh, you know, you can take it with a grain of salt, but when the Almighty says it, uh, you can depend on it because he is the creator, the giver, and the taker of life, and if God says it, it's going to happen. And that's where this news came from. It didn't come from a man. It came from God. Then Hezekiah, verse 2, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Now, uh, you know, we see somewhat of the, of the character of Hezekiah uh, in two ways. Number one, he turned his back and, you know, got his, got his attention off the news. You know, sometimes the very best thing we can do is just not react. We, we live in a world that is built on spontaneous reaction, and then we say something, and it never can be taken back again. Right. We do something, and there's no changing it. But Hezekiah, in his wisdom, he just turns kind of away. He's not ugly uh, to Isaiah. He doesn't uh, say, oh, you've got to be wrong, Isaiah. Tell me something else. He just turns his back and lays the other way and begins to cry out to God. You know, some of the best time we can spend is in prayer. Amen. And we'll find that Hezekiah's prayer was very short. It wasn't lengthy. It wasn't long. It wasn't drawn out. But he went in before the Lord and prayed. Uh, that's time in this life very, very well spent. Uh, you know, I uh, often look at the historical Baptists and you know, you know what I find consistently different with them and us is prayer. Um, an individual's prayer time, not not group prayer, and group prayer is wonderful. But an individual's prayers before God, they meant business when they prayed. They sought the face of God when they prayed, uh, and, and there was no limiting them, and they wanted to hear back from God when they pray. And so we see that that Hezekiah was that kind of man. Verse 3, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, or I beg you. Now, I think it's interesting because the Lord really doesn't have a memory. He knoweth all things. But using his own understanding of himself, Hezekiah says, Lord, I want you to look at this. Look at this situation. Look what I've done in my life. And you know, that's a good way to spend time too. Amen. Look at what you've done. Mm -hmm. Look at what you've accomplished. Or sadly enough, among most believers today, what you haven't accomplished. Amen. Uh, what we haven't got done. Yeah. Uh, what still lies out there in front of us. And, and so uh, Hezekiah begins to make a list of things that he had done, done to honor the Lord. Now, I, and I believe him sincerely in this because I think if he had done it to, our, our, to uh, honor himself that the Lord would have told him so. So uh, Hezekiah was genuine in this when he says that he stood up for the Lord. He did because God honored him. Honored it. And Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed and said, Lord, and said unto the Lord, remember, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before thee in truth. Now, I want you to see the, the first thing that Hezekiah reminds him is how he regarded the word of God. Now, when he says he walked before him in truth, I mean, he doesn't mean that he was always uh, walking before him, uh, telling the truth or being honest. He was walking before him in truth. He was walking before him in the word of God. And more and more I see in the years that I have lived, people are not doing that anymore. Uh, if it is offensive to them, suddenly it's not in the word of God anymore. Oh, that's just your interpretation. Well, you know, the, the, the English language in the, in the King James Bible is written on a third grade level. It don't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. 
What they, what, what, and see, the word of God hasn't changed, they've changed. And we find that Hezekiah wasn't this type of individ an individual. Apparently, he stuck to the stuff. He was consistent in his service. And he says, you remember how I walked before you. And then he says, uh, and with a perfect or complete heart. Uh, a heart that is completely dedicated to you. Now, this is only for the redeemed this morning, and, and, and again, we're talking about time, and we're talking about wasting time. How perfect is your heart? How complete? How full? You know, a lot of times, we're always wanting something more, are we not? That's not a perfect heart. It indicates you're missing something. Remember, in, in the Lord Jesus' sermon uh, uh, concerning the woman that, ha that ha I found the peace that's missing? That's most of us. We're always looking for more. Remember Martha, the sister of Mary, how all she could ever focus on was cleaning house? She was never, ever content. Yeah. And so, as Hezekiah is in this prayer to the Almighty, he says, remember I'm perfect, I'm complete. Not that I'm sinless perfection, but that I am complete in you. You remember that, O Lord, and then it says, that's all the prayer, very short, very, very, uh, I think like maybe 30 words. And Hezekiah wept sore. Now, uh, let me say this. Be careful what you pray for because you may get it. Mm -hmm. Because Hezekiah did. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing, Hezekiah's life was extended and the nation of Israel was preserved but then Jeroboam was born in that time. And the most ungodly, wicked king that Israel would ever have to endure. And, and it was because Hezekiah didn't die. It was because, now, you know, we, in that we get to this, and we have to be very cautious of living in the permissive will of God. Uh, finding, finding the ideal perfect will of God, you know, he, he just said, uh, I've been perfect before you, is a very difficult thing to do. Because, and, and this is the thing, it is not satisfying at all to the flesh. Uh, and that's what we really want to satisfy. When, when the water's boiled off, it's about us, right? And, and, and so we see then that uh, Hezekiah uh, made this prayer and God answered it. Uh, it was an effective prayer, but again, would it have been better for Hezekiah to accept his death? I don't know. I think it did teach him the preciousness of life. You know what I have found about people dying in families? It teaches the others a little bit of how precious life is. And uh, we, as the Lord's people, need to pay attention to that. Uh, verse 4, immediately we hear, we hear answers to this prayer. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go thy way to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Now, to me, that's a very effective prayer. And, and we find uh, this space of time, 15 years, that's a long time. When, 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 I, when I look at it numerically, 15 years ago, I was still in my 30s. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, <laughs> All my children were still at home. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, there were some wonderful things going on. A lot can be done in 15 years. Now, I believe what Hezekiah learned is this, how precious time was. And I'm sure he was very committed for those 15 years to come. And you know why? Because he knew there was a certain end date, they were precious to him. And, and I'm telling you this morning, there is a certain end date. I don't know when it will be. Uh, Hezekiah had that benefit that we don't share. But listen, you are on a charted course. You are on a timeline. And the end most certainly will come. And the only question that you can answer is, do I know the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Am I genuinely born again? Have I made my calling and election sure? That's your only, that's your only thing, whether it be five years, 15 years, or 20 years, that's the question that you must answer yourself. Uh, and, and we'll find that Hezekiah uh, did just that. But again, Rehoboam was born in that window and probably, again, it wasn't the perfect will of God. Verse 6, And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Now, he gets two additional blessings he really doesn't pray for. He gets his extended life, but he says, Also, I'm going to be sure you keep the throne, and I'm going to, I'm going to defend this city, and Jerusalem is going to stand. You know, uh, uh, it's amazing sometimes how God blesses just for one individual. Caleb and Joshua, four and a half million Jews, I believe they were the only two saved in the whole lot, and God let God protected them and guided them for 40 years for the, de for, for the deliverance of two individuals. That's the God we serve. And so because of this one individual that prayed, we find the whole city, the whole country is preserved at the prayer of one man. That, that's time well spent, is it not? That, that's time that you can, uh, you can use to, uh, that can be used to the benefit of others. Prayer was very effective. Verse 8. Uh, verse 7, and this shall be a sign, and the Jews were all about signs and wonders and, and following things in the sky, and this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. In other words, he's going to do all these things, and this is your guarantee that it's going to happen. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of degrees, which is gone down the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward, by which degree it is gone down. In other words, he's going to turn the sun backwards, and we're going to relive some time. Now, I did a little bit of mathematical equations this morning, and 10 degrees of a sundial is 3.6 minutes. Uh, 3 minutes and 40 seconds repeated. You know, well, that's not much. That's not, that's not a whole lot going on. Uh, well, have you, ever, have you ever relived three minutes and 40 seconds? I haven't. Once they've been behind me, they're behind me. They're done. I, I can do nothing else about it. But we find that, that Ahaz, in his, uh, in his blessing, everyone that lived at that time got to live those, two minute, th those three minutes and 40 seconds again. What would you do? You think about the worst situation you ever found yourself in. And what would you do to relive it again? How long is three minutes and 40 seconds? You say, well, that's no time at all. Well, uh, our singing last song this morning took two minutes and a half. Average meal in an American household, and if you're like us, it, it very much proves to be true about seven minutes. That's it. We are very much in an instantaneous world. We, we take no time with anything. And because of that, this is a spiritual condition of the world which we have today. We, we take no time to focus on the Lord. We take no time uh, in reverence. You know, you know the biggest problem with modern day uh, religion? Um, all, all these shysters that are out here. I saw a list of them the other day and, and just had to turn and shake my head. Is that a, a patient's house? And they, they have no depth. And the reason they have no depth is they take no time. Joel Osteen, Brother Jarrett was telling me about this the other day. If something bad, this was his sermon. If something bad happens in your life, God will make it up to you later. I mean, I, I just, I had to just say, surely that man don't believe that. You know, you know why he's so stupid? He doesn't spend any time in prayer. He doesn't spend any time in study. 
Three minutes. And you, you think about your longest prayer. Was it more than three minutes and 40 seconds? 3.6 minutes? Think about the most precious time you spent in study. How long did it last? What do you do on an average day? Now, this was just the other day for me, and I, I wrote it down because I, I began thinking about this sermon several days ago, and, and so uh, I'm using Friday, this last Friday, for an example. It was one of my average days, although this was a little bit more compact. Friday, it's got to where, and every time I ever work home health, it's this way, Friday is always like the day you dread. Most people look forward to Friday. I dread Friday because you know it's going to be a million things to do. I got up that morning at 6.30, which is a little late for me. You can tell Don, you can ask Donna. I usually get up right at 6 every day. I was a little tired. I slept a little later. It put me behind. And immediately, you feel like you've got to be on the rush. Got up. Donna was running a little behind, too. Didn't get out of the house to 7.15. And that makes me feel very, very nervous. I'm going to be late for work. I took off for Paris. Hit work about 8 o'clock. Forgot to clock in. I mean, this is how that whole day went. And then uh, I, I, I was somewhat caught up on my computer work, so I did a couple of things there. I called my first patient and said, hey, I'm on my way. And then, Larry, you got an admission this morning, too. And I was like, great. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I'll do it after my first visit. I got to my first visit's house. Had to send the patient to the hospital by EMS. So uh, you don't just send the patient, you know, you, you would be not much of a nurse if you don't wait for the ambulance. I, that day I wanted to say, okay, I'm going to go on, the ambulance is on its way, but you can't do that. And so uh, again, I had that, finally got to the admissions house at 10. Very lengthy process. It's not just sign here and take your blood pressure. Left at 12, two hours. To, uh, Two hours in one house, got that done, and then I saw another patient, and saw another patient, and then another patient. Each of these visits about an hour, left Paris Landing at 3.30. Got to the house, I was on between three and four, just somewhere in that neighborhood, and said, uh, there, some old girl comes by in my house that I've never even seen before. I'm like, who is this? And uh, I mean, that's how my day went, and one of Bella's friends, and uh, and then, uh, after I saw this little girl introduce myself, Sarah comes in and goes, hey, Daddy, we're going to go eat. And I was like, yay! And uh, changed my clothes, got something to eat. Uh, we uh, went to Clark Troy and got to the restaurant and drug Joey out of the car. And this woman comes up behind me and goes, excuse me, sir. I was like, yes, you have a flat tire. And I looked back at the car. I mean, it was past flat. And I was like, okay, this is going to be all right. Got in the restaurant, ate a bite, took forever for our food to get there, ran across the street to the tire shop, got the tire changed, went to Nashville, Don and Joey came home, me and the girls went to Nashville so we could ride our balloon the next morning. We got to the hotel room about eight, and I watched this TV. Uh, the older people here will remember this, remember Hawaii Five O. there's a new one now. And, uh, we uh, watched two episodes of Hawaii Five-O, and I was exhausted. And I thought, as I was laying there, because then I couldn't go to sleep, and what have I really accomplished today? What have I really got done? And by that evening, I had figured, I figured it up, and I had, I had been up, so I, I went to sleep about midnight. And by that point, I had been up almost 18 hours. And I began to wonder, and I got to thinking, except maybe for prayer time, when I was blessing the food, I don't even know that I had named the name of Jesus. Is that not wasted time? I believe it is. Is that, is that time well spent? I don't think so. Did it, but is anything that I did necessarily wrong? No. Uh, I wanted to spend time with my family. I, I, I wanted to see my patients because if I don't, if, if I don't uh, work, <laughs> I don't eat. And, and all the thing, in other words, it's nothing necessarily evil that's consuming our time, but are we doing what we should be doing? Is first things coming first? Yeah. 
Or are we like Martha? Martha, Martha, thou hast troubled over many things. <laughs> yeah. But one thing is needful. Yeah. And Mary hath chosen that good part, mm -hmm. and it shall not be taken from her. And certainly that's where we should be in the modern day. And listen, this is this is something what I have found in, in, in the years that I have lived, it is getting worse instead of better. There's more to do now than I ever remember before. You know, when I was a boy, um, especially in the cold winter months, we would shut off the bedroom and it'd be just two bedrooms in front, I mean two rooms, the front room and the kitchen, and we would mostly sleep in the in the front room on couches and stuff. And um, bust our own wood and everything like that and it seemed like there was more time then than there is now I mean literally going in the creek bottom getting the wood chopping it up putting it in the house and still there seems like there your time wasn't as consumed I, I really believe Satan has gotten us to that point that we literally have no time now Except that three hour, three minutes and 40 seconds, we've never got to relive anything, right? So that brings us down to this. What are you going to do with the time that you know you have? The only thing that I know that I have is the next maybe five minutes. You know, before I complete this sermon, I may fall out here and be going on out to be with the Lord. So when you begin to look at it, that time becomes precious. It becomes the gem that it's supposed to be. It's, it becomes the diamond that, 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 that only few men possess is the time for right now. And how will we use it? Now, two things I will suggest to you. The first one is study. And the second one is prayer. Those two things need to be spent. Uh, be, be part of your agenda every day. Before, before you... Uh, uh, before you even get going good, begin to uh, speak to the Lord. Now, I want to look at, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, very familiar verses of script, uh, Scripture, Luke chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Luke chapter 4, in the first verse, the Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit unto the wilderness. Now we find here that Jesus is going to use his time very, very wisely. Now you think about the Lord Jesus Christ being God and man simultaneously and that as soon as he arrived here on the earth, he being an, even an infant in his mother's womb, as soon as he came on the scene, he knew exactly when he would die and the day that Calvary would occur. He knew that coming in. And you know what? I think it made life more precious for him. Now, maybe we're so ignorant in our flesh that we, uh, we don't catch it that way. But, you know, sometimes the preciousness of life it's lost because we focus on the same thing. We focus on the wrong things. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, things happen in our life seemingly to turn up the world upside down. Does it really change your priorities? It should. People come and go. People come into your life and they and they feel around and they're gone. It shouldn't turn the world up on its edge. It, it, it goes on. You know, the only thing, the only constant in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about across your life. I've known Donna since I was 12. She's, uh, we were married when we were 19. But that's still not constant, is it? Because I had the 12 years before, and really we didn't really get well acquainted until we were 17. And... So I have, I have, I, she's not been a constant. You see what I'm saying? My children have not been a constant. Mother's no longer a constant. She's, she's gone 15 months ago now. There are no constants in this life. But we like to think they are, don't we? But there's not. There's, there's, not, there's nothing, nothing stable about the life that we live here. 
The only constant is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and, and so we find that uh, certainly we could use that a, a, as a rich example, knowing that when we arrive, the end is already set. When we come into this world, uh, so maybe it would, would reshape our priorities knowing that there is an end from the beginning. And, and we very certainly don't always work in that, in that realm. And so to do that, first of all, uh, it says that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. We need that. Redeemed people, listen to me, we need that. We need to be full of the leadership of the Holy Ghost. We need to be full and directed by Him. Uh, you, you know how you're going to have your best time well spent? Those three, uh, three minutes and 40 seconds best used is when you're full of the Holy Ghost. And listen, you know what? What I've come in the last five years among God's people, instead of getting better, it's getting worse. People are flat running on fumes. You, you, you know, you know what? Uh, you know what will happen to your car if you run it on fumes. Modern day, uh, it'll burn up your fuel injection, and they don't just give you one of them. You know, when we were younger, if you ran out of gas, all you had to do is dump some more gas in the carburetor, and you'd be good to go again. Not that easy anymore. Are you full of the Holy Ghost? Where, 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 where are you at? That's the first question. If you want time well spent, the, these hours and numbers and days that he's that he has given to us, if you want to use them wisely, where are you at? Do you have the presence of the Holy Ghost to help you with that? And with that, notice what happens, and was led by the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, into the wilderness. Now, I find, that, I find that significant because it separates him from other people. Now, we often use the guidance of the Holy Ghost in a whole lot of the wrong ways. But I want you to see that for a very needful reason, the Holy Ghost isolated Jesus. And sometimes the Holy Ghost is going to isolate you, at least in mind where you can't connect with other people. You know what? We need to give up trying to connect with this world. If you're really devoted to Christ and you've really been born again, you're not going to connect anyway, so why don't just give it up? Just forget about it. A lot of your energy and what you feel stressed about will be going away because you will no longer be doing something that has no fruit anyway. So... When Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost, it led him to be by himself. Um, we need some time along with the Lord Jesus, do we not? And, and, and we need it more and more and more as the days go uh, as the day, days go on. Verse two: Being forty days tempted of the devil. So he's led in the wilderness, and he spent 40 days alone. Have you ever spent 40 days alone? I haven't. I, I have never, ever, I, I would say the most I've ever spent by myself completely alone was two days. And, and then we're usually missing whomever we're usually around, right? Now remember, uh, Jesus was still fully man and fully God, and so I'm sure he missed his mother and daddy. By this time, at this time in his ministry, he had he called no disciples unto himself. He had not started preaching yet. He had not been, uh, he had just been recently baptized by John. And here we find him being isolated and alone. You know, why is that everyone's biggest fear? Being alone. It is. I've taken care of a lot of people down through the years, and I'm telling you, elderly person, one of their biggest fears is being alone. And uh, I think uh, I think sometimes just spending some time alone with Jesus would be good. Now, you, you think about how challenging that would be in your own life. And every one of us this morning has, has a different situation. But I'll use myself as an example I've got a lot of responsibilities that I cannot shy. <coughs> I've got to make a living for these folks right here. 
If not, the Bible says I'm worse than an infidel. And so I've got that to do. <laughs> and when I get home, there are things to be done. My mowing is behind as we speak, so I'm gonna try tomorrow evening to get out, get on the tractor, do some mowing, get them some things caught up. And when I get home, uh, there'll, there'll be a meal to eat, which Donna's used her time to prepare. And then after that, we, you know, and by the end of the day, you're like going, where would I have fit anything else in? We've got to make the priority. You know, you know why going to Paris is on my bucket, on my priority list? Because I've got to do it. So when you know when you're going to spend more time in prayer and more time in study is when you know you've got to do it. So it, it just simply becomes shifting. Now, 40 days ago, if, if I am correct, we were in uh, uh, April the 26th, I think. Uh, April the 25th, somewhere in there. What were you doing? What were you doing on those days? Now, I know what I was doing, but it's only because it's Donna and Matthew's birthdays. And uh, uh, that day, uh, the 26th, I, 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 I had to think of which one it was, but I, I think it was the 26th. On the 26th, I worked all day, came home and brought Donna some roses, and that was, that was the, what I remember about that day. If it was Matthew's, um, I think they came over for a little while. And, no, I took him a birthday card over there. Donna did one, one of us. Maybe we did it together, I can't remember. And uh, we took him a birthday card and wished him happy birthday. And that's all I remember about those two days. So what it, does, what it tells me is this. Apparently, I didn't go before the throne in such a way as Isaiah did. When Isaiah said, <laughs> I was in the spirit of the Lord, I, I was spinning, and I saw him high and lifted up, Isaiah, Isaiah 6. Apparently, I wasn't doing that, right? Because I have no memory of it. I believe if I had an experience like the Isaiah had, that it would, it would be seared in my brain even this morning. But it wasn't. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm thinking my memories of those days was just like I said. Now, I want you to see that when we do make those provisions, which is rare, we find the Lord Jesus Christ, the very living Son of God, uh, only one I can see really doing this, getting his, uh, <laughs> and immediately the devil shows up. See, when we began to set that three minutes and 40 seconds aside, look out, the devil's going to be on the scene. He's going to be disturbing things. He's going to be interfering with things. He's going to be making things difficult. And he does exactly just that. And he attacks the Lord Jesus in the flesh. The way, And the reason the devil always attacks in the flesh is he really doesn't understand the spirit. Remember when... Uh, <laughs> when you're considering the person of Satan is this. He is a created being. Mm -hmm. He does not have an eternal soul. Yeah. Yeah. And so he cannot think on spiritual things. So he's going to give you fleshly things because he understands that. He, he, he knows what makes us tick carnally. So when he attacked the Lord Jesus Christ, having no understanding that he was closer to the Lord than he had been, probably since he took on this wretched flesh, uh, that he would be all filtered out. But see, Jesus had spent time with God, and that had prepared him for what was what was now to come. And it wasn't a few verses. It's get thee hence, Satan, thou art a fence unto me. And off, off he went. So we find, or that's what he said to Peter, but we do find that, I think the Bible says actually, and Satan left him for a while. And, and so we, we find then much of what we do is time wasting. Much of what we do has no eternal value. Much of what we do is just making do to the, ne to the next 
the next time. Now, I want to go to Hebrews, and we're going to uh, read one verse together in Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll dismiss. Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 27, very familiar verses of Scripture. The Bible says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. <coughs> now that's the appointed time. From the beginning, it's already set forth the appointed time, the time when life would end, the time when things would be, that we would be no more a living being here. The time had arrived. Now you think about all the different people that you've done down through the years, some given long, fruitful lives, some not so long. I often think about Miss Pruitt, uh, Darwin's great-grandmother, Diane's grandmother, uh, a little past 90, I think, maybe closer to 91. Uh, and then I think of David. 62 years? What a huge difference. 28 years. You know, uh, and, and not to be, but just to make you very aware of the, of the, of the caution, this is how, how cautious and precious life is. When David left out for Lake County that day, you know, I bet his anticipation was to spend time with his friends and come back to Dover. That would be mine, and it, it's a long piece over there. Um, but see, it, it, it didn't happen that way, did it? His time came. And really didn't matter if he was in Lake County or Dover or Clarksville. The end result was the same, was it not? One day, it's going to be the very same for us. This life shall cease. And then the only thing that will matter is what you have done for Christ. Yeah. See, a lot of what we do is wood, hay, and stubble, is it not? And what we need to focus is on the spiritual. Listen, nothing in this life can be more precious than Christ. That is the only... You, you know, when the man found the pearl of great price and he sold all that he had. Remember when I preached, was it Wednesday night or last Sunday, about the, the rich man? He had the pearl of great price standing in front of him. And he never even seen it. He wasted his time, did he not? Do not waste this life. It is way too short. It is way too short to spend it only running after the things this world has to offer.